really high and blue being sea level is the lowest starting at zero. Um, this is a topographical cut of what a mountain would look like. So you can see how it goes up. It has a little valley that dips down and it gets to its highest point and stops. And then it goes down on the other side. Um, so what you also need to know is the coordinates of cats around me back at that time, which is 106 degrees, 18 minutes, and 45 seconds west, because it is west of the prime meridian, and is 42 degrees, 50 minutes, and 46 seconds north of the equator. So talking to you about how to find this is Jordan Ruckel. to look at 
when they're coming across. Say the moon and it was supposed to appear at 5 o'clock, like I said, and it's actually appearing at 8 o'clock on this clock. That means that he is now three hours um, ahead or behind, depending on which way it went, um, of Greenwich, and so he can set his new clocks to that time. So he would set his clocks to wherever he is, and that's how he got his longitude. Altitude, um, again, two instruments. Um, first one was the barometer. It was pretty simple. All he had to do was hang it from his uh, a stand. Usually he uses a telescope stand. Worked really well. As you go higher, altitude-wise, there is less air, which means less pressure. Um, that's why out in space, uh, astronauts have to wear special suits. There's no air. Um, that cause problems for them. Um, so the way this works, air pressure pushes down on the little mercury in your dish down here. As you go higher, there's less air pressure, so it fills up. It fills up because the mercury column right here is lowering, so more mercury comes into your dish, and then there are little millimeter markings on your glass tube, which basically say the lower this is, the higher your altitude. Um, the other way that he found his altitude was with a thermometer, hot water, and a uh, source of heat. This table right here shows that at zero, at sea level, water below is at 212 degrees. As you go up every 500 feet, uh, it de the temperature that you need to boil water decreases by one degree. Therefore, um, say you're at 5,000, you can see all it takes is 202. So, pretty easy. So what he would do, um, usually it would be Freud that did the boiling of the water. He would set up his little pan of water and everything, boil his water, take the temperature that it boils at, and that was his um, altitude. So they could get pretty consistent because they have two methods. And so, yeah. Uh, the only other tool that Fremont used was a compass. It, he used it to find his north, south, east, west what uh, compass is for. He would uh, use that for navigation, finding, like I said, which way is north, all right, we're going to go that way. Which way is west, we're going to go that way. And mapping, say he's making his map, and he sees independent rock over there. He, he'll set down his uh, compass and say, oh, it is over to the west. Um, that is right on the map, it's to the west. Look that way if you see independent rock continue. Uh, next talking about politics and then will be Lucas Lasso. Metaphor. 
Now, when, the, when America would be forged, it was mainly on the east. And over here you have what was considered Mexico, and this is where Texas is, and Alaska, but right here, here is where no one had claimed. And, well, if we wanted to claim the West, we had to go over there. So to make such a giant lake, or a feet, okay, was very hard, and it was only 28 men who made the journey. So in order to make that, um, to make that journey in the amount of time they were given with the tools and everything, it was considered to be somewhat risky because if they, there's a chance they don't come back alive or they just don't come back with the right information. So this was a big event for America as far as claiming land. Next up, who will be helping me uh, talk about Fremont and the man and the journey is King Cohen. started an expedition, originally started in 1842, and the whole thing um, began practically, or land-wise, was in Missouri, which is not uh, too surprising considering the man who funded it was the center of Missouri. So, the places that he went were some of our, um, our some of our state's greatest monuments, and those places do include things like Independent Rock, Fremont Canyon, Fremont Peak, and Ghost Island. As you may have noticed, Fremont was very fond of naming things after his last name. <laughs> so the journey is like, when Fremont was in, um, when Fremont, his whole journey took place about in three months, roughly. However, that was because he didn't stick to the original plan, which was for him to stop in Independence Rock, and then after that, just turn back and head back to Missouri. But he saw this huge peak, which is the third highest peak in all of Wyoming, and he decided to climb it. And that was not the original plan, nor was it the best of plans, because the men were kind of optimistic about going up there, and it was a dangerous journey for all the stuff they had to carry, and it was, um, like I said, uh, difficult for them. But they did do it, and he named it Fremont Peak, which is uh, all right, so Fremont's father-in-law, Thomas H. Penton, that Lucas mentioned, uh, got Congress to fund the expedition with $30,000. Uh, Penton was referred to as the architect and champion of westward expansion. Um, later on, after the expedition, Ben actually wrote the Homestead Act to try and lure people to the west by giving them land for free. Benton believed heavily on manifest destiny. Um, manifest destiny, which uh, people uh, in the expedition uh, referred to themselves as agents of God's plan. And Benton also said that if we lived where we, if we lived in the West, we owned it. He was saying this because in this top corner of the United States of America was the Oregon country, which was also owned by Britain. And so, Ben really wanted to own it for America. Uh, this quote, uh, we don't, the author is unknown as possibly Th Thomas Jefferson, but uh, it says that it is America's right to stretch from, <coughs> from sea to shining sea. Not only do we have a responsibility to our citizens to gain valuable resources, but we also have a responsibility to civilize this beautiful land. So Fremont was actually chosen for a specific reason. Fremont, being the son-in-law of Benton, um, had gained trust with Benton. Uh, ben also knew that Fremont was a good map maker and a top topographical engineer. This meant that Fremont knew how to use the tools that I mentioned earlier, such as the sextant and chronometer. Fremont had also married Benton's daughter, Jessie Benton. Uh, he secretly married uh, Jessie Benton without Thomas Benton knowing at the age of 17. Later on, they got married, and 
wanted to improve their relationship between Ben and Fremont. Now we have Frank telling you about the extra people on the exhibition. Beautiful, uh, beautiful and high quality cows. 
which was just a female buffalo bison. Um, so in quotes here on July 25th, it says, low scaffolds were erected upon which the meat was laid, cut up in the thin strips, and small fires kindled below. Our object was to profit by the vicinity of the buffalo to lay stock provisions for 10 to 15 days. So as you can see in this picture, I was just trying to get the idea of the scaffold that they might be using. But, and then this picture also got me thinking, so these are fish, but they never talked anything about fishing. Being on the river as much as they did, I would have expected that they would have fished at least a little bit. It's just something to think about. And then on July 30th, uh, they, this was the first encounter of Mount Sheep, which they refer to as Goat. Uh, and this spot that they found them soon became known as Goat Island. <coughs> so in quotes here on July 30th, we saw numerous herds of mountain sheep and frequently heard the volleys, rattling stones, which accompanied the rapid descent. This was the first place we killed any of these animals. And we have frequently seen horns three feet long and 17 inches at the base, weighing 11 pounds. Other animals they saw, they ran into a home of prairie dogs while they were hunting some buffalo. This home was described uh, to be in two miles diameter with a very consistent uh, hole for a prairie dog every about 10 yards. They also, well, they only found one grizzly bear on the entire trip, in the three months of the entire trip, and they also found an abandoned, an abandoned dog in the of course. Now we have Frank telling you about Manifest Destiny.
you would be able to see four of them at all times. Um, and uh, so, uh, um, the job of the GPS is to receive the information of the satellites and uh, use it to find its exact position on Earth. Uh, I will do the demonstration setup, I guess. Say that you're completely lost for whatever reason. It's somewhere in the United States, you don't have a clue where you are. So you walk up to a friendly stranger and say, hey, where am I? Um, and that person says, you're 625 miles from Minneapolis. Uh, that's kind of helpful, because now you know that you're 625 miles from Minneapolis, but you could be anywhere in that circle around Minneapolis. So you go up to another person, ask her, where am I? She says, you are 690 miles from Boise, Idaho. So that's really great. But now you have two spots that you would be. So you still don't know where you are. You can either be up here or down here. So if you walk up to a third person and say, where am I? They tell you 615 miles from Tucson and Arizona. That is great because now you can say, oh, look, I'm right here, which is Denver, Colorado. Uh, that's kind of what the GPS will do, except with uh, a 3D kind of perspective. If you can think of each one of these as a globe, um, each one of these, instead of being a place in the United States, is a satellite up above us. What the GPS will do, because if you can, I don't have any, well, all right. So, what happens then, because it's a globe, each satellite has a big sphere around it that is saying, this is how far you are from this satellite. So, it can either be with this, there are two points that actually hit with the spheres. There's one way out here somewhere in space, and then there's one somewhere on the, United, uh, on the Earth where the GPS is. So the GPS completely forgets that one in space because it's useless. It's not like you're in space. And it says, oh look, I'm right here on Earth. This is where I am. Um, so pretty easy, pretty cool. Uh, and I'm going to hand it over to Franklin. He will tell you um, how Fremont's court is compared to what we found today. Right. So by using the GPS system and satellites on Google Earth, we were able to pinpoint that this is Independence Rock with these coordinates. But Fremont was relatively off by almost 15 uh, miles or 19 degrees, which was about an entire day's travel for him. And these coordinates put his Independence Rock up here. Now, if you're coming along on the Oregon Trail and the path has been made, you're the first person on the Oregon Trail, and Fremont says, Independence Rock is here, but there's no rock around you, it will make a really big difference. So, in general, his longitude was pretty far off because of the fact that it was just being created and how to accurately find it. But his latitude was really close, uh, as you can see, wasn't all that much higher up. Um, his cache camp is definitely found. So we compared how far off his coordinates were in general. So in general, he was about 16 degree, or 16 minutes longitude off, which is still pretty big. And if you go backwards, because he was always further off into the west, so I came backwards and put his cache camp around Casper which would put it in about four paths for Eric, as he described as being on the river, which some of the things he described in his journal was where he was at what time of day and what all was around him. So he described Cash Camp as on the river, but his other spot was nowhere near the river. So we moved over, kind of further over, over, sorry, to where uh, it was on the river. So are there any questions or comments at this time? Mm -hmm.
our satellite that was kind of bright and moved this that speed, and I recognized it was a satellite. lost his instruments out in Fremont Canyon. Did that set his whole uh, expedition back? Did he have extra instruments? Well, were, were they recovered? I didn't address that because I didn't know what happened. Because the playable map that um, it's similar to what you have that way, except it was experimental. And when he saw the canyon, he decided that he would be the best map to see if he would actually work. He brought a pack of food and some of his um, instruments on it, but when the current got stronger, it fell over, and the instruments were small, but uh, were, uh, were lost during the river. I still haven't found it today, but it did slow down the progress for now. Hmm. So most of the things he's bringing for elevation and the impact with the other things. But it was a big loss. 
in that poor lake, he, I know the picture showed that he was using the sun. That was just, um, I guess, to find the height of the sun in the sky. That wasn't for Fremont. Fremont was trying to find his latitude, which means he was using the North Star, which is not nearly as bright as the sun. So he would have been fine because he was using the North Star um, had he been using the sun. Um, I do know that they had little protective lenses that you could flip over. Um, yeah. They can change the brightness when you look through the little uh, lens thingy. It makes it either darker or lighter. All right. backwards with what you extrapolated out of his calculation errors. Are you guys looking forward then to finding other sites where he cached or um, things that were mentioned to correct some of the journals? Well, we just, uh, I specifically looked in his journal to find other coordinates and his coordinates were relatively about 16 minutes off in general. I did not look into other expeditions because by that time they would have more sophisticated equipment and it would have been a little bit more accurate.
really believed in the expedition to travel west. That's uh, well, they believed that God told them to travel west. Uh, so for the most part, pretty much America That is why we don't know a whole lot about it. Uh, all we know is that, based on other experts' opinion, uh, Tom Ray came and talked to us about it and said he did not get the instrument, so we really don't know much about that. Perhaps he just um, thought it was not necessary, but he thought he should just go up there and get it. I started in Missouri. Started seeing a bunch of the 
uh, white men starting to move into that area. I understand that to them, uh, 30 people was just a, a crowd. And to see hundreds of people, thousands sometimes, even moving in was uh, phenomenal. But what they said, or what some of you said, is there even a lot of people over there? Thanks. Are there any other questions or comments? Yeah.